In the book of Malachi, we read of a series of complaints the Lord has against the Jewish people. They had the temple, they were following through with sacrifices, but his complaints were concerning the behaviour of the people. The priests were offering lame and blind and sick sacrifices, and they were not telling people the mind of God. They were not dispensing the wisdom of God. And the people were dealing treacherously with one another, particularly in the area of marriage, an institution that God created and he loves, but has always been under attack by Satan. And so the Lord raises his complaints. Men are being unfaithful, that they are divorcing their wives. And so marriage is not producing godly offspring. And the same issue pertains in Western society today. Marriage is severely under attack by unfaithfulness, by divorce, by redefinition. In chapter 3 he said, But the Lord is coming, and he will come as a judge. He will come as a purifier of silver. So we have the picture of the furnace removing the dross so that the pure silver remains. This is a very severe process, but it does not hurt the gold and silver. It just hurts the dross. But there has to be a separation. And so he will establish his kingdom, he says, where he will be swift to judge the sorcerers, the adulterers, the perjurers, those who exploit others, those who do not love their neighbour. But the Lord's character is not changed. And he is still waiting for people to return to him. Return to me and I will return to you, he says. He continues on. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. My name's Arthur, and I thank you for joining me. As we consider the question, how can a man rob God? From Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Well, it's actually simple. By embezzlement. When a contractor is given money to perform a particular development, and he takes some of the money and puts it in his own pocket, outside of the terms of the contract. That is embezzlement, misappropriation. Then I am stealing from the person who entrusted it to me to use for his purposes. God has entrusted us with a life and possessions and opportunities which we are to all use for his glory and honour. But we think, no, it's my life, it's my house, it's my possessions. We don't acknowledge that these things are all entrusted to us from God. And when God entrusted these things to the Jewish people, part of the covenant he established with them was that they should give him a tenth of the produce of the land. And for those who didn't have land, the Levites, they were to give a tenth of what was given to them. And this tenth was basically the taxation system by which the society operated. The Levites lived off the tenth from the people, and the priests lived off the tenth from the Levites, but it meant that the goods needed to be handed over. And if the people didn't bring their tithes in, then the Levites, had to go out to secular work and could not fulfil their function in society and the whole society struggled. God's promise to the Jewish people was that if you give me 
the tithe, then I'll make sure that there is plenty for you. You will not run short. Now, the New Testament doesn't, doesn't place tithing on believers. Tithing was part of the Old Covenant, but it is not part of the New Covenant. Nevertheless, God does not change, he told us earlier in the chapter. And the principle of giving is still, is very much part of the New Testament. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus taught us. But now, the amount we give is not mandated in percentage terms. Rather, the objective is that there be equality. But the principle reminds that we are entirely his and we are to live our life completely for him. The early Christians did not consider anything they had as their own, but they saw it as belonging to the company of believers. And so it was used for the blessing of others, not just for themselves. But in our present society, There are many people who are relatively rich in this world's goods and I would be one of them because God's blessing comes upon those who live in a godly lifestyle and the question remains, what are we doing with those riches? Are we using them the way the Lord intends us to? He says, you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me even this whole nation. If we do not honour God with our possessions, then the things that he has given us that we have not returned to him become a burden and a curse to us instead of a blessing. We think that money is a blessing. We think that nice possessions are a blessing, but they become a curse if we are not using them for the glory of God. That which is meant for good becomes evil to us. So we are to trust the Lord with our possessions. And the Lord Jesus has a lot to say about our generosity to believers who are in need. Now, the real fulfilment of this prophecy will be in the millennium. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. But in the present time, Australia and many nations suffer from droughts and flooding rains. It is God's judgment because as a nation we are not honouring him. But our leaders are challenging God at every stage. But the Lord resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore humble yourselves before God, James said. While ever we are proud we will be under God's judgment. And Australia is a very proud nation. We're all the time boasting of our position. And yet the Lord is all the time saying, hey, hang on there, this is mine. You are robbing me. You do not acknowledge that this world was created by me. You've robbed me of my creation. And you use it for your own indulgence. But when we humble ourselves before the Lord, then the land will be productive for us because the Lord can trust us to pass on the fruit of the field to those who are in need. And then all nations will call you blessed, Malachi says, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Of course, we don't expect Australia to turn back to the Lord. The scriptures make it plain that wickedness shall increase But there should always be individuals in the nation who swim against the tide, who trust the Lord with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding, who serve the Lord, who always do those things that please him, who are the salt and who are the light and who live for the Lord. Our blessing, as Peter and Paul explains, will not be immaterial wealth at this present time but we will be storing it up in heaven where the moth does not eat and rust does not corrode and the thief cannot steal. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, 